Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about viruses, what they are, how they're a little bit different from, um, you know, other small infectious agents. So on this page, I'm pretty sure at this point, everybody is familiar with what that is. Um, that is SARS-CoV-2, which causes uh, COVID-19. Um, and that is um, an animal virus of a specific class that we'll talk about in uh, a little bit later on in the lecture. Um, so... Uh, we're just going to start with a basic introduction of viruses. So what really are viruses? Um, they're considered, they're defined as obligate intracellular parasites. So that means that they really need to be inside of the cells of another organism to reproduce. So they don't have their own replication machinery. They need a host in order um, to function and in order to replicate. So because they can't reproduce and function normally outside of a host, they're not considered to be cells and they're not considered to be living organisms. Um, so, you know, whenever you hear people talking about vaccines, for example, they'll say, oh, it's just a dead virus. That's technically not correct um, because viruses aren't live. So there's not really, you know, you can't really kill a virus because they're not a living thing. Um, I think pro probably the, the proper term to use would be attenuated, um, which means that it's sort of like a weakened strain or um, they'll take out the replication machinery or any something like that that weakens the virus to the point where it's um, not able to reproduce. Those are the types of um, viruses that we use in vaccines, well, certain types of vaccines at that matter. Um, but they are not considered cells and they're not considered living organisms. So keep that in mind when you're learning about them. Um, that's really what separates them from other, um, other smaller infectious agents. Um, they were first visualized using electron microscopy because they're too small to see using light microscopy. So using a regular microscope, we can visualize things like parasites, um, we can see bacteria, but we can't really see viruses because they are so much smaller. They could be, you know, hundreds of times smaller than a bacteria that they're infecting. Um, so it was really only until we developed these uh, electron microscopy techniques, I believe in the late 19th century, that we were able to visualize viruses. Um, so viruses reproduce by invading cells and hijacking the host's replication machinery, as we mentioned. Um, and while they come in all different shapes and sizes, Generally, all viruses have the same structure. So all it is is just nucleic acid encased in a protein shell that we refer to as a capsid. So it's pretty much just um, this genetic information surrounded by protein. And that's really all viruses are. Obviously, they have you know, different classes of viruses that act different ways and infect different things. But a virus is just a protein shell containing genetic information. Um, and it's really its one function is to spread. So we'll talk a little bit about the structure of viruses. So for this first about half of the lecture, uh, we're gonna focus on a specific type of virus called the bacteriophage. Um, and that is the type of bact that is a type of virus, excuse me, that infects bacteria only. So I'm sure th this is pretty much the representation of a virus that you would most often see in pop culture. So if you look to the right on that diagram, uh, this is a 2D representation of the bacteriophage. So you can see over here is the capsid head. Um, so that's the protein coat that's surrounding the nucleic acid, which is inside of it. Um, and most viruses are classified by the external shapes of their capsids. So these bacteriophages have what we call a polyhedral head. This is just a 2D representation, but if we saw it in 3D, um, it would be three dimensional, a three-dimensional polyhedral shape. Um, and they also do have this sheath down here, um, which we can categorize as helical. So because they have multiple different shapes on this virus, um, we they're somewhat complex in structures compared to other ones so we consider them you know we we consider their structure complex other viruses which we'll see in a minute on either the next slide or one of the next other slides um they're simpler they're usually one shape so like they could be um helical kind of like the sheath and that would be the entire virus or it could just be like the capsid head of this bacteriophage and the virus the complete virus would just be um polyhedral so the fact that there are multiple different types, multiple different shapes of uh, proteins that are coming together to form this specific virus, we would consider it to have a complex shape. Um, right, compared to coronaviruses, for example. So if you go back, this coronavirus is much more simple in shape. It's just you know a round uh, protein capsid. It has those spike proteins, and it's also uh, encased in an envelope, which we can talk about in a little bit as well. So when a bacteriophage lands on the target cell, remember we're talking about bacteria because that is the, that is, um, the species that this specific virus will infect. It's tail fibers and then it's base plate attached to the cell. So it lands on the cell with these tail fibers standing up exactly how we see it here. 
and then its base plate lowers onto the actual cell. So when the base plate is secured into the bacteria's cell wall, um, the sheath will contract and it injects the nucleic acid into the cytoplasm. So it'll attach this base plate to the cell wall. This sheath contracts, and when it contracts, it, this nucleic acid shoots out of the capsid head, down the sheath, and it's injected into the bacteria. So note that the viruses that infect animal cells will often interact with surface receptors and they're gonna fuse with the plasma membrane. Um, this is not possible in bacteria because remember bacteria have rigid cell walls. So there's really no way for these viruses to destroy the cell wall without destroying the actual cell. So the way they enter it is just by injecting their nucleic acid inside. Um, and then that nucleic acid is going to hijack the uh, replication machinery of that bacteria. And then it's gonna create more of these bacteriophages from the inside. Um, so many animal viruses, a membrane known as an envelope surrounds the capsid. So we have a couple of different shapes of viruses down here, a couple of different classes. Um, we have helical, which is sort of uh, remember like that shape of the, um, the sheath of that bacteriophage. And an example is the tobacco mosaic virus. I actually believe that that was the first virus that was visualized under electron microscopy. Um, but it's a much simpler shape you can see than the bacteriophage. We also have a polyhedral, which again would be sort of like the head of the bacteriophage, but it's just the bacteria, um, it's just the virus itself. An example of that is uh, the adenovirus. And then we have spherical over here, like coronaviruses or the influenza virus. Um, and again, it's the same thing. It's just a very simple spherical shape. Um, it's surrounded by a membranous envelope over here. And then we have glycoprotein spikes that are sticking outside of it. And you could see just side by side how much more complex the structure of a bacteriophage is compared to any of the other three. Um, so like I just said, in the animal viruses, membranes known as envelopes surround the capsid. So you may be wondering, what, what is the reason, what is the function of a membranous envelope surrounding that hard, rigid uh, protein capsid. And the point of that is um, it actually, it, it allows the animal viruses to come into the cell and come out of the cell much more easily. So the membrane is created as these new viruses are released from old host cells via budding. Um, and that is actually, um, we're going to talk a little bit more in a little bit about the specific life cycles uh, that bacteriophages and animal viruses um, actually go through. But if you're producing, it's pretty intuitive that if you're producing viruses inside of an animal cell, we don't really have to bust through that cell wall like we would if we were talking about, um, you know, like a plant cell or a bacteria cell or something like that. So the way that some of these viruses can escape sometimes without actually destroying the host cell is through budding. So they sort of just uh, go right to the plasma membrane, it circles around them, and then they're released in this little vesicle. And the vesicle is, it's a phospholipid bilayer, just like the plasma membrane of the actual host cell, um, and it's surrounding the capsid, and we refer to it as an envelope. So this envelope, this membrane, also allows this new virus to fuse into an a, a new animal cell. Um, it allows it to fuse into that cell membrane so that the naked capsid can gain entry. And it does this by two ways. So it can, depending on the virus and depending on the specific cell that it's targeting, we have this membrane. Um, you know, if it's similar enough and if the conditions are right, it can just automatically fuse into the membrane. The, um, the membranous envelope is going to dissociate into the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane of the host cell, and then it's going to release the capsid into the cell. Um, and it, it, we could, this is also accomplished by receptor-mediated endocytosis. So, so those glycoproteins that we can see, for example, on the spherical influenza virus, um, those can interact with um, surface receptors of regular cells. And these surface receptors are used in, you know, everyday functioning for other options. If this is just the virus um, that is hijacking this sort of function and it's using it for its own benefit against the host cell's health. Um, so it attaches to this uh, receptor and then it undergoes a process known as receptor-mediated endocytosis. So the cell usually does this uh, for things that it needs. So if it's taking in nutrients or food or anything like that, um, but the virus is just taking advantage of this natural system. Um, it's attaching, um, and then it's endocytosed, and the spherical, uh, the spherical influenza virus would be taken up by the animal cell. Um, and it's just important to note that this is not possible for bacteria cells. This is for animal cells only, because again, we have that rigid cell wall, so there's no way that we can have this membranous envelope um, fuse with the cell wall because it's just rigid proteins. And it also does not 
um, the bacterial cell walls do not express any receptors. So again, that's why the bacteriophage has to use, you know, a little bit more complicated of a method. It has its tail fibers. We have that base plate that goes in and then it injects its, um, its DNA into the host cell. So a little bit different bacteriophages um, infecting bacteria and these other animal viruses that are infecting animal cells. They're a little bit different. 